Welcome to In a Heartbeat, coming to you from the studio of WMTV Channel 5 in Gross Point Farms at the Gross Point War Memorial. We are broadcast also throughout southeastern Michigan on both AT&T UVerse and the WOW cable network. I'm Dr. David Bolley, and I'm your host for In a Heartbeat. I'm so pleased to be able to bring to you today Dr. Robert Chapman. Dr. Chapman is a noted, respected, and recognized lung cancer specialist. He received his medical degree at Cornell University. He did his postgraduate training at Henry Ford Hospital, and he was a fellow in medical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I'm happy to introduce to you Dr. Robert Chapman. Dr. Chapman, welcome to In a Heartbeat. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Dr. Chapman, I'd like to start out as a, as a noted lung cancer specialist. Who gets lung cancer and what are the, the risk factors for developing it? Well, the answer is far too many people get lung cancer, that's for sure. Um, obviously, the number one risk factor that's uh, responsible for close to 90% of all cases is tobacco. Um, cigarette smoking especially, we tend to forget about the effects of secondhand smoke. Also out there is asbestos and radon gas. They're certainly known risk factors. Um, asbestos plus smoking is worse than either alone. Mm -hmm. Radon gas, uh, which seeps from the ground into basements, is a risk factor. The problem with that is most people have no idea what their exposure to radon gas is. I mean, one can, you can go to a hardware store and get a kit to check and see whether you have any. Uh, and most of us fortunately don't, but it's very sporadic, but potentially dangerous. So in, in your home, you could potentially be getting exposure to radon gas and there wouldn't necessarily be symptoms, and you'd really have no knowledge unless you were tested. That's right. It's colorless, odorless. Yes. You have no idea that it's there. Is there any, are there any predisposing factors for somebody developing radon gas in their house, or is it? Not no, it, it's uh, location. You know, because it's something that comes from the ground, <clears throat> and um, uh, you you really don't know unless unless you check it directly. It's it's probably responsible for a, a tiny percentage of mm -hmm. lung cancer overall. But even if you talk to a relatively sophisticated audience, uh, medical students or even physicians, and ask them, what is your personal lifetime exposure to radon, most of them don't know. Dr. Chapman, I'd like to follow up on something that you mentioned, and that is secondhand smoke. Do you think people really have a concept of how important that is? And are there any statistics which show us what the implication of exposure to secondhand smoke is? Yeah, there's no question that um, we know it's very, very serious. It's, it's, it's definitely implicated with lung cancer. It's implicated with other lesser lung diseases, um, asthma, uh, bronchitis, things like that. Uh, it's not as serious, as direct, as uh, smoking directly, uh, which we can correlate, as I mentioned before, to at least 90 percent of, uh, of lung cancer. And I like to think of smoking, obviously everybody who smokes doesn't get lung cancer, but everybody who gets drunk and drives 100 miles an hour doesn't have an accident. That's but a good analogy. You're certainly not improving your odds if, if you do it. What thoughts or insights, Dr. Chapman, do you have on uh, tobacco addiction and, and, and any demographics you have on that, or how difficult is it to, to stop smoking? Well, the history of tobacco usage and addiction in the United States is very interesting. I think one of the most brilliant marketing schemes ever occurred during World War I. At the turn of the century, from the 18th to 19th century, lung cancer was such an uncommon disease that you could go to medical school, practice your whole career, and never see a case. Really? That's exactly true. However, during World War I, uh, R.J.R. Reynolds and the other 
big tobacco companies had an absolutely brilliant idea. For every U.S. GI who went overseas, they gave them, in their GI rations, a pack of cigarettes a day free. Wow. What did that do? It created an entire generation of young men who were nicotine addicts, which is what they were when they came back from overseas. And prob I'm sure at a time like that, under the conditions that they were facing, if they got some sort of relaxation from that, it was oh. addictive. Everybody smoked, um, and at that time, nobody knew it was bad for you. Um, so they came back and, of course, got jobs and bought cigarettes. And when you think about it, World War I broke out in the 19-teens. World War II broke out in 1939, a generation later. So you literally had the sons and daughters of the World War I vets going overseas to fight World War II, it worked so well, World War II veterans had a free pack of cigarettes every day in their GI rations. Um, I mean, my dad was a World War II vet. That's where he was introduced to smoking. Mm -hmm. And every war since then, until, you'll never guess, long after the Surgeon General's report went out, they continued to do that. The I Korean no War... Idea. The Vietnam War, same thing. The interesting story about how it stopped. When Iraq invaded Kuwait and we decided we needed to go and free Kuwait in Desert Storm, that was when um, the first President Bush was in office mm -hmm. uh, and we decided to send our troops there. We had to negotiate with Saudi Arabia because we wanted to use Riyadh as a staging area to send our troops north through Kuwait into Iraq. Well, as a very strict fundamentalist Islam nation, Saudi Arabia would not agree to let the U.S. troops come in if they brought either tobacco or alcohol. Interesting. And that was the first time we stop giving free cigarettes to our uh, troops when they fought overseas and we haven't done it since. And I mean I'm almost embarrassed to say it had nothing to do with the Surgeon General's report mm -hmm. but that's probably one of the best things Saudi Arabia ever did for us. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, kind of moving forward a little bit, uh, Dr. Chapman, what are some of the, the symptoms of lung cancer? It, it, uh, it can sort of creep up on you, can it? That's one of the reasons it's so dangerous. Lung cancer, I may not have mentioned, is far and away the number one cancer killer. We think of breast cancer, we think of prostate cancer, we think of colon cancer, even pancreatic cancer. More people die of lung cancer every year than those four combined. I think that's an amazing statistic. It's, it's, uh, it's scary. Well, why is that? Well, tumors can develop and grow in the lung with no symptoms at all. If you're a smoker, you may already have your smoker's cough with which you're familiar. You know, if it gets a little worse or a little, you don't really think about it. However, once you get symptoms that really catch your attention, the cough is much worse or you're coughing up, heaven forbid, blood, uh, you develop pneumonia, often by that time, it's so advanced that it may be incurable. In fact, one quarter of lung cancers first present at a time when it's not what's in the lung that alerts the individual that something's wrong, but it's something from a place where the cancer is spread. A typical story, somebody will go into the emergency room with seizures, do a CAT scan, there's a tumor in the brain, you look further, it's spread from the lung. The first sign had nothing to do with the lung. It was a seizure because of the brain. Or you develop a bone, bone pain or a fracture or some other sign that has nothing to do with the lungs or the chest at all. That's really a difficult battle. It's a very, very difficult one. Are there any ways a person could possibly prevent uh, getting lung cancer aside from maybe stopping smoking, as hard as that may be, or are there any screening measures in place? Okay. Uh, 
two things. Nicotine is tremendously addictive. Um, and in studies that have been done in laboratory animals, it is more addictive than crack cocaine. So when people say, I just have a hard time breaking away from it, they're telling the truth, it is hard. Um, for many years, for decades, we've looked for good screening tests for lung cancer. And uh, the chest x-ray is not an effective screen for lung cancer. I mean, one of the reasons it's so difficult, I mean, we have colonoscopy for colon cancer, we've got mammograms for breast cancer, we don't have something like that. Recently, a large nationwide test was done looking at CAT scans in uh, individuals who did have a significant smoking history. And in those individuals, um, we were not only able to detect lung cancer more early, but by having those screens compared to a chest x-ray screen once a year in smokers, we found that the mortality from lung cancer actually decreased 20%. Great. Um, in a disease that is responsible for over 150,000 mortalities a year, that's 30,000 lives a year potentially that could be saved. Um, on the flip side, the CAT scan is a lot more expensive than a mammogram or a PSA. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a, it's a uh, I think, a, a difficult challenge. And the CAT scan is so sensitive, it picks up lots of little things that may have no clinical significance. So one needs to sort through all of that. Do you have any statistics, Dr. Chapman, on the prognosis for somebody who may be facing lung cancer? It really depends on how early it's caught. If you're lucky and it's caught early, there's no spread to lymph nodes and it can be removed surgically, the uh, chances of cure are 70 to 80 percent. So, I mean, you think, well, 20 or 30 percent is still a lot. Yeah, but that's the best case. Um, mm -hmm. For um, individuals that um, have a little bit more spread where it may be spread to lymph nodes um, early on but is still surgically removable, the chance of the cancer coming back after surgical resection is as much as uh, 40 to 50 percent. Most of those patients will not do well in the long range. Um, if you look at the majority of people who are diagnosed at a time where it's too late for surgery. Um, you talk less of cure rate, you talk more of what is the proportion of patients that live one or two years. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on how advanced that is, um, at two years, a majority of people are, are usually gone. Dr. Chapman, how is lung cancer treated? Okay. Um, Obviously, for the lucky ones, um, if it's small and early, surgical removal is the treatment of choice. Because many lung cancer patients are, are smokers, they may not have good lungs, they may not have good heart function, which of course is also affected by cigarettes. Um, some patients may not be good surgical candidates. Um, and for them, there are excellent radiation therapy techniques to, uh, to treat early uh, tumors. For cancers that are more advanced, uh, chemotherapy becomes an important uh, part. And um, for certain situations, we can combine chemotherapy with radiation. Uh, there are many um, drugs that we use in lung cancer that actually enhance the effectiveness of radiation to treat. Mm -hmm. And so um, using those two treatments Concurrently, we have made a significant advance in our ability to control lung cancer. What's really exciting have been some of the new discoveries in molecular biology. We've actually been able to identify molecules on the surface of lung cancer cells that are commonly mutated. And these are molecules that influence the cancer cells to grow. 
And in those cases where we see mutations in these molecules, we can give them literally a pill that interferes with the function of those molecules and see responses in 60, 70, or 80 percent of the patients treated in that way. That's amazing. That and is really amazing. And perhaps can even be applied someday to other cancers as well. Well, and in different ways it, it is being applied. I mean, a whole huge area of oncology now is learning at a molecular level what makes these tumor cells different from their normal counterparts and exploiting those differences uh, literally at a molecular level, often with um, medications that can be taken orally. Of course, what we've also learned as we look at this is that these cancers are far more complex than we ever realized before. I mean, tumors may look absolutely identical under the microscope, but then when we look at what we call their molecular profile, um, there are tremendous differences. And, mm -hmm. and those differences will reflect how fast they'll grow, how fast they'll spread, um, what agents may terminate the cancers, what agents may have absolutely no effect on them at all. Dr. Chapman, a thought came to mind. I, I tend to think of patients who may potentially have lung cancer being of a certain age. How young is perhaps the youngest patient that you, you can think of who's had lung cancer? I have seen a rare patient in their late 20s. That's amazing. Um, I've seen uh, an uncommon patient in their 30s. Mm -hmm. um, on average, patients, the average diagnosis is in the mid-60s to 70s. Um, uh, the risk is really related to the cumulative amount of um, tobacco usage over time. I think part, that's part of the difficulty for so many people in that there's a, such a lag time in between a certain behavior and uh, the results of what that may do to somebody later on in life because I think people, you know, people are busy in their lives and they're feeling good, they're active, they're healthy, and they, I, do, I think they just don't really have a concept that my behavior may mm -hmm. impact my life irreversibly later on. And when people are young, they, they have a sense of immortality. They mm -hmm. feel good, they can do anything they want, they're strong. And that tobacco may be bad for them doesn't really impact their lifestyle early on when they're picking it up, which is often in their teens or 20s. But then 30, 40 years later, uh, the cumulative effects can be devastating. Dr. Chapman, you're, you're a man who wears many hats and also as the director of the Josephine Ford Cancer Center. Um, I think there are many neat and exciting things going on there. Can you share any of those things with us? Yeah, there are a lot of things going on. Um, so many that we've taken a step back and looked at ourselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way. I mean, for example, we're uh, very active developing a cancer surgery uh, program that, that, I mean, we do cutting edge surgery in, in so many areas, in prostate cancer and in, in breast cancer and... Um, while, you're, while you're mentioning that, I don't mm -hmm. mean to interrupt you, but you were really a pioneer in the development of robotic surgery for prostate cancer. And maybe you could share with us that as you sure. go on to tell us about the forum. Well, that's actually a very nice story. Um, We've uh, really are the first um, institution in, in, the, in the United States to look at a robot. And the advantage of the robot is that it's able to use very small instruments um, during the surgical procedure that are perhaps too fine for human hands to manipulate so that during the surgery where you're being guided by three-dimensional TV cameras that are literally inside in the operative field, you can spare and save tiny nerves and vessels and other um, small structures that grossly would be almost impossible to uh, with our 
big clumsy hands mm -hmm. and we don't have to stick our big hands in there we're sticking much smaller um, instruments um, in the field so that we can do stitching and, and cutting in a much more precise way than, than we could with our hands. So we've been able to take this tool that's able to do this very, very fine, delicate work and apply it initially to prostate cancer. Um, we've since applied it to bladder cancers, to kidney cancers, uh, to lung cancers, and, and others. The advantage is that patients are subject to a much less invasive procedure. So there's less blood loss, people recover more quickly, and uh, it's, it's grown very rapidly as a result, but um, it is something we're very proud that we've been able to pioneer and move forward. <laughs> and it's, and so um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you were going on about some of the other things that are going yeah. on at the Josephine Ford right. Cancer so, Center. So that's an example of how cancer surgery has, has progressed. And, uh, we've we've uh, grown rapidly our gynecologic oncology program. We've grown our orthopedic oncology program. We're uh, mentoring young researchers in cancer uh, into careers in which um, they will be you know, funded by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, all of these things are happening. And so when we stood back and we looked at all of these centers that are cancer related within the Henry Ford Health System, we said, you know, we should really think of the Josephine Ford Cancer Center more broadly as the Josephine Ford Cancer Institute in which all of these cancer focused centers and programs exist. And uh, the Institute really knits these programs together and creates an infrastructure in which they can collaborate and work together. And so really within just the last month, uh, we've made a decision to rename ourselves the Josephine Ford Cancer Institute. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, I w also want to touch base on you're involved in some research. You've partnered with the Carmanos uh, mm -hmm. Center. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, let me take a step backwards because this is a very interesting story. Back in 2006, uh, we were involved in work with Medicare, and we were one of six institutions that uh, conducted a demonstration project in which we looked to improve cancer screening in racial and ethnic minorities. Um, we focused, because of where we are in the inner city, on African Americans. Uh, five other centers, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, also focused on African Americans. Mm -hmm. MD Anderson in Texas focused on Hispanics, as did uh, New Jersey Medical Center in Newark. However, the University of Utah in Salt Lake City um, focused on Native Americans and um, in Hawaii, they focused on uh, Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. What we did was we used a nursing navigation program to reach out into the community, the Medicaid, Medicare population, and work to improve their screening in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. And uh, the other organizations did the same in, in their groups. Well, just as we were starting, I received a phone call from CMS, where Medicare is based in Baltimore, saying, we just learned there's a program at Carmanos, uh, which is focusing on um, community uh, networks, but they're focusing on the same minority demographic that you are. I need you to contact the folks at Carmanos to make sure your programs aren't going to contaminate each other. Mm -hmm. And that was the National Cancer Institute sponsored program. Ours was Medicare. And no stepping on anybody's toes. <laughs> no stepping on anybody's toes or ruining anybody's work. So I called the director of the principal investigator of the program at Carmanos, and uh, her name is Terry Albrecht. 
I don't think we were on the phone for 90 seconds before we realized these two things are complementary because we were looking to recruit people to screen. They were contacting community organizations and trying to teach them of the importance of these things but had no access to the screening. And when we worked together, they helped us get together with more community organizations. We helped provide screening. And in fact, it became a very symbiotic relationship for both of us. Well, as it turned out, their program began a year ahead of ours and on a five-year cycle. Ours was a four-year program. Mm -hmm. So that they both ended in 2010. Ours was not renewable, but theirs was. And I got a phone call at the time when they were ready to apply to renew their program, and they said, would you like to join with us as a co-principal investigator and we'll make a joint application to the National Cancer Institute to continue our community network program together. That's fascinating. I, I, I truly wish I could hear more about it and maybe at another time we can. <laughs> but uh, our time has uh, run out. And I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Chapman, for taking time out of your busy schedule to share with us that wonderful and valuable information. Really appreciate David, it. David, it was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers as well. As always, we appreciate that you tune in to see our show. Take good care of yourself and those around you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.